Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club, our moderator and instigator for this program today. Today we're going to consider an issue that is crucial to all Americans, how we can improve our care of the chronically mentally ill. In the 1840s, a social reformer named Dorothea Dix surveyed the care for the mentally ill in New England and found them to be living in terrible conditions on the streets, in poor houses, and in jails. She crusaded to establish mental institutions or asylums to take better care of these indigent and incarcerated mentally ill. And a network of asylums was built around the US to play this role for a century and a quarter. Today, approximately 10 million Americans suffer from serious mental illness. Over the past 60 years, social, political, and economic forces have resulted in the closing of the publicly funded psychiatric institutions, or asylums, that initially grew out of the 1840s reformist movement in favor of community treatment in which outpatient options and the ability to live independently seem promising and in many cases less expensive than inpatient care. Early this year, 2015, a controversial paper by a group of bioethicists at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. They argued that, in the words of the report's title, it's time to bring back the mental asylum because comprehensive, accessible, and fully integrated community-based mental health care continues to be an unmet promise. Most disturbingly, the report contends, US jails and prisons have become the nation's largest mental health care facilities. Their report cites recent studies showing that half of all prison inmates have a mental illness or substance abuse disorder. Prisoners with mental illness are two or three times more likely than prisoners without serious mental illness to be reincarcerated. And 15% of state prison inmates are diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. The report goes on to argue that new models of fully integrated, patient-centered, long-term psychiatric care now exist in the United States, and that facilities reflecting such approaches are needed to provide 21st century care to patients with chronic, serious mental illness. Should severely mentally ill people be better integrated within the community and care provided within the community? Or should a new type of asylum with the literal connotation of the word asylum as a place of sanctuary be created. Our guests today have very different perspectives on this issue. Dr. Dominic Sisti is the principal author of the January article in the Journal of the American Medical Association calling for a re-examination of the potential role of the asylum. Dr. Sisti is director of the Program for the Applied Ethics of Behavioral Health Care and assistant professor in the Departments of Medical Ethics and Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Sisti's current research examines the ethical and philosophical dimensions of the concept of mental disorder, with a particular focus on personality disorders. Dr. Renee Binder, to my immediate right, is president of the American Psychiatric Association. She's a psychiatrist at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, and an advocate for better community treatment. She has said that the answer to better treatment lies not in the fact that asylums have been closed, but that they have not been replaced with adequate funding or organization for community care. Dr. Binder specializes in the evaluation and treatment of patients with schizophrenia, depression, bipolar affective disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. She is also the founder and director of UCSF's Psychiatry and Law Program. Her research focuses on violence and criminalization of the mentally ill. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Renee Binder and Dr. Dominic Sisti. We've asked each of our guests to start by taking five minutes to present their perspective on the institutional or asylum approach to treatment versus the community treatment model. So shall I have first Dr. Bender? No, it's first Dr. Sister. I'm sorry, first Dr. Sister. Yes. Sure, that's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, I just want to start by saying thanks for having me. I'm very uh, 
humbled to be here. This is a really uh, exciting opportunity. Um, and to call the paper a uh, report, I think, is kind of generous. It's like a 1,100-word op-ed piece, really. Um, and we, um, in the paper, we try to make an argument that um, turns out to be somewhat controversial. And let me just um, first uh, tell you why we wrote the paper, and then um, just kind of give you a sense of what we're not arguing, so that we don't get off on um, some tangents about um, bringing back, you know, um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the institutions that were made so infamous in uh, the films of the 1960s, um, for example. Um, and then I'll give you a sense of what we want to, um, in, in sort of a positive way, um, um, uh, bring back, if if that's the right way to put it. Um, so why did we write it? So um, my department chair and colleague and mentor, really, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, and I have been talking about this issue since uh, he came to Penn in early 2012. And it turns out that um, Zeke happens to be a provocateur of sorts and uh, thought that it was time to write a piece on the, um, the really, I think, morally embarrassing state of mental health care in America. And um, as an architect of the Affordable Care Act, he um, sort of turned his, I guess, sights on mental health care as one of the next frontiers of health reform. And uh, as an ethicist at, um, at Penn, I am uh, specializing in the ethics of psychiatry and uh, the allied behavioral health care uh, field, and I've been very much disturbed by the way in which mental health care has been delivered in prisons, mostly. So, you know, these things have um, been in the news, I think, nonstop, really, in the last six or eight months. But, you know, back in 2012, we started meeting and started thinking, geez, we really need to say something about this. And as bioethicists, you know, it's weird because you would think that there'd be a whole area of research and, and a, a robust literature on the ethics of, of mental health care in America, and there really isn't. So this was, a, this was an area, I think, that was a blind spot for professional bioethics, and we decided that we need to at least start the conversation. So we did that, and uh, you see, hopefully folks had a chance to read this short paper. In the paper, we try to make a case that, um, that inpatient uh, psychiatric settings um, are actually part of a continuum of care. Um, they're not, in, you know, I should actually back up and say um, it, it really ought not be considered a, a sort of um, dichotomous choice. It's not community versus institutional care. It's community and institutional care. I mean, I think that's where I think a lot of the controversy sprang was uh, from a misunderstanding of the paper, actually, because, you know, the subtitle kind of freaked people out. But also, I think the idea that uh, we're trying to somehow say community care has failed utterly and that we should put people away in perpetuity, that is not what we argue. That was, and that actually was sort of the initial response we got from a lot of um, advocates, actually. So we had to sort of correct the record on that. It didn't help that uh, the sort of Philadelphia Inquirer, <laughs> there, there was a piece in the Inquirer the, the day this p the paper came out, and uh, while the article was really, I thought, well written, the image on the website was a picture of Philadelphia State Hospital, which was by Barry, which was an infamous uh, snake pit of the night that was closed in the 1980s. So, and then me smiling next to it, like as if that's what I want. Um, so it was not a very uh, nice week or weekend for me um, as my inbox filled up with hate mail. The, um, but that's not what we want. That's not what we argue. And we say it very much explicitly in the article that psychiatric, structured psychiatric settings are in fact part of a continuum of mental health care that's been neglected. And, you know, rightly so, we close a lot of these places down. Uh, what we're trying to argue is that we need to rethink long-term psychiatric care in a way that embraces the recovery principles, right, where in individuals with serious mental illness can actually take part in their care planning in a very active way, if, if, if possible. I mean, we're not, again, we're not sort of utopian here. There are going to be times when individuals will need to be treated maybe against what some would say is their will, um, uh, uh, but if they're incompetent or incapacitated, that's you know, debatable type of semantic, but, um, but you, know, there's, there are, you know, there's a role here for structured care settings. And then we go on to say that there's examples that exist. One example we mentioned is um, the Worcester State Hospital, now the Worcester, State, uh, Worcester Recovery Center, but there's other really interesting models out there, uh, including uh, therapeutic farmsteads, a place called Cooper Reese outside of Asheville, North Carolina, that does some really amazing work, and other types of places where people can actually go live, get the treatment they need, and be stabilized. And it might be six months, it might be a year, it might be two years. 
but these places exist. Now, one of the problems is that, how's my time? Um, I, should, mm -hmm. I should stop. Uh, is that a lot of these places are very expensive. So we need some state-based or sort of public type institutions for individuals uh, who need this type of platform to begin or continue their recovery. Um, I'll get into more of the details about the argument and then some of the objections we heard um, as we go through the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Bender. So the name of the article um, uh, that Dr. Sisti and his colleagues wrote is Improving Long-Term Psychiatric Care, Bring Back the Asylum. And the examples um, that are given in the articles do involve long-term care. As you said, it could be six months, it could be a year, you know, but um, I am going to argue that that is not a good thing um, to do. So I agree that we certainly have a problem in the United States. Um, we can walk out in the streets of San Francisco or in New York and we see homeless people on the streets. Um, a significant portion of them have problems with substance abuse or with mental illness. We also have a large number of people with mental illness in our jails and in our prisons. And this is a shame, actually, um, for the United States, um, in my opinion. Um, the jails have become, de facto, the largest psychiatric hospitals um, in the United States. That's true of Cook County. It's true of what's called the Twin Towers um, in Los Angeles and in Rikers Island. People with mental illness do not do well when they are in jails and prisons. They tend to be victimized and they tend to stay longer um, in the prisons than people who don't have mental illness. But the cause of this situation is because we have cut back the funds for mental health care when state hospitals were closed. And the solution is not to reopen long-term facilities. And I'll get into more of that um, in a minute. So just my background, um, I am a psychiatrist at uh, UCSF. I'm a clinician. I'm also a researcher. And I ran the adult inpatient services at Langley Porter Hospital for over 20 years. I started when I was very young um, in the 1970s, and a lot of the um, state hospitals had closed, um, and they started to discharge patients from the state hospitals really in the 60s. So on the unit, we had people who had been um, in the state hospitals and who had what we used to call um, an institutionalization um, complex or um, you know, had all of the negative um, impacts of institutionalization. Um, as head of the inpatient unit, and I still work at times up on the inpatient unit, I certainly believe that hospitalization is necessary at certain times for treatment and for stabilization. But it's important to discharge patients as soon as they're stable. And I am opposed to institutionalization. So what happens at institutions? So Irving Goffman, who's a sociologist, wrote a book called Asylums in 1961 based on the state hospitals in the 1950s. And I know that Dr. Sisti and his colleagues are not talking about um, bringing back the state hospitals um, um, as they were in the 1950s. But some of what Dr. Goffman describes is just a part of being in hospitals for a long period of time. So what happens when you're in the hospital? People aren't fanalized. So they're told, it's now time to eat lunch, it's now time to eat dinner, you need to go um, into the dining room, um, it's now time to go to group, um, it's now this is your recreational time, it's now time to go to sleep. So um, people become very dependent as opposed to being independent and having autonomy. There's a lot of paternalism in hospitals. We know what's best for you. You need to participate. 
take this medication at this period of time. And hospitals are not good for people. I mean, we've learned that even in terms of treating um, physical illnesses. I mean, years ago when a woman had a baby, um, she would stay in the hospital maybe for two weeks or so, you know, after the baby. Nowadays, they get you out of the hospital as quickly as they can. And, you know, part of it is the understanding that it's important to get home. You know, if a visiting nurse visits you, they want to see how you can bathe your baby in your own sink and in your home and not necessarily um, in the hospital. And there are complications to being in the hospital. It used to be when people had a heart attack. You know, they would be at bed rest, they'd be at hospital, you know, for a long period of time. Now we talk about getting home, getting back into your usual um, routine. And in one of the commentaries that came out about this article, um, there is a psychiatric patient, a consumer, who describes what he feels about um, institutionalization. And I just thought I would read it because he says it better than um, I could say it. So his name is James Price. And he um, uh, spent five or six years at the Philadelphia State Hospital. And so to quote him, he says, it was hard living there. I had to stay in a day room and wasn't able to get out. We had a dormitory with eight to 10 people. I got in trouble there a lot. They'd put me in seclusion restraints and give me needles. And then he says after he was released, he was able to live independently. He could see his friends and family. Um, he could volunteer. He could even hold a job. So what is the solution to the situation that we see on our streets and in our jails and prisons? It's not asylums, but it's increased community programs, including programs for prevention and programs for early intervention. You know, as was mentioned um, this year, I'm president of the American Psychiatric Association, and we have um, a bunch of um, programs um, through our foundation, and one of the programs is called Typical or Troubled. And it's addressed um, to school systems. A lot of the um, uh, school systems throughout the United States have adopted it. It's an educational program for teachers, and it, it helps teachers identify is this typical adolescent behavior, or could this be troubled adolescent behavior? And the teachers are not expected to have the skills to intervene, but it's recognizing it and then referring to a mental health professional. And this is just an example of the kind of program. We certainly need an increase in funding. Nothing works without the increase um, in funding. And we need models besides putting people in long-term care. So one of the models that we actually use um, in San Francisco and in um, other jurisdictions, but certainly could be expanded, is the issue of collaborative courts. So there are drug courts, there's behavioral um, health courts, um, and these are examples of diversion programs that when someone does commit some sort of a violent act, and especially a more minor um, infraction, that they are given the option of entering mental health treatment and substance abuse programs rather than going to jail um, or prison. Federal funding for community mental health centers ended in 1981, and block grants were given to states and services decreased. In 1999, the US Supreme Court came out with the Olmstead decision, and it has to do with the American um, with Disabilities um, Act, and essentially it says that people with disabilities should be able to live like people without disabilities. And certainly, needless institutionalization and isolation from society is a form of discrimination against people who suffer from mental illness. There are legal issues related to treatment, and we can certainly discuss that um, if there are questions about that. The whole issue of coercion. Um, I believe um, that it's very important to be respectful of people with mental illness to encourage participation. Assertive community treatment works very well for many people with serious mental illness. One of my colleagues calls it pester therapy, where people are on the street and you keep saying, you know, hello doc, hello doc, you know, what do you want from me? And you know, that finally um, they go in um, for treatment. 
Um, in San Francisco and in other cities, we have citywide case management. I know in the audience, um, we have some psychiatrists who work for citywide case management. But these are the sorts of programs that need to be funded and that are really helpful. But most of all, patients who suffer from mental illness need hope and they need reintegration. In other countries, there is a lot of evidence that it is best to integrate people who suffer from mental illness back into their communities. Asylums or removal from communities leads to hopelessness and dehumanization. What we need to give to people who have these terrible um, illnesses is respect, autonomy, and hope. So I will stop there. Thank you both very much. So I'd like to start with a couple of questions, and I'm getting quite a few audience questions, and I encourage some more. I'd like each of you to address how the institu improved institutional solution or the improved community care solution would address those behaviors or issues that are most problematic for the severely mentally disabled. Inability to earn a living, not taking medications, living on the streets, antisocial behavior, not obtaining preventative medical care, et cetera. So in your model, how would the institutional setting address what we see and deal with and hear about every day in terms of the problems of the chronically severely mentally ill, and how would improved community care, on the other hand, do that? Uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think that we're talking about possibly different populations, because I think there are, for the most part, um, you know, community services work for a vast majority of seriously mentally ill individuals, but there will be a subsect, sub subpopulation that does need a more structured environment within which it can be ensured that they are compliant with their medication. And um, so the institutionalization option, to me, is, 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 is one place where that can happen. Now, um, the other piece to the proposal is that an institution um, will be a medical um, sort of climate or milieu, right? And uh, th that beats a prison milieu. So, uh, you know, in, insofar as individuals who have acted out, who have behaved in the ways that you just, you've described, find themselves behind bars, uh, those are individuals who maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago would have found themselves in state hospitals. Now, and, and this is uh, sort of, that's a paraphrase of a, of a psychiatrist by the name of Richard Lamb, who's been arguing for many years that, you know, deinstitutionalization has had both positive but negative consequences as well. Um, and, you know, uh, w so the, the idea that an institution would be this monolithic sort of Goffman-esque total institution, of course that would be bad. Um, other sociologists and, and scholars like um, Andrew Skull and Gerald Grob have argued that there's a mixed, you know, there's, an, <laughs> there's other ways to look at that period. And, uh, you know, those institutions provided... Um, in a lot of ways, a last resort for individuals who were very desperate. And, you know, it diverted them from jail. Now, Dr. Binder, I think, wisely pointed out that there are diversion programs, and we have these in Philadelphia as well. Um, there are mental health courts uh, that work very well with um, the population that needs them. However, when an individual is determined to be seriously mentally ill and, and needs to be basically confined in some way um, because they're not safe to themselves or others, there's nowhere to put them. There are no beds. The forensic hospital outside of Philadelphia, Norristown State Hospital, has a two-year waiting list for its forensic unit. So where do these folks go? Prison or jail. They go to Kern Fromhold Correctional Facility, which is a jail outside of Philadelphia where I visited, and I actually gave a little talk on this paper, and the inmates there were like, this makes sense. My cellmate is floridly psychotic and lays around all day on Risperdal. Now, is that therapeutic? So. You know, what I'm arguing is not so much a return to these Goffman-esque, coercive, sort of cuckoo's nest places, but a, but a medical facility that treats a medical problem in a way that is structured and coherent, that allows individuals who cannot stay compliant, let's say, in the, in the community, to be more compliant, gives them the support they need. 
Um, you know, if that's coercion, if that's paternalistic or parentalistic, okay. I, I mean, I will definitely give ground on that. But I think that, um, you know, to heal an individual sometimes, you do have to nudge them in certain ways. You know, you talk about pestering, pestering me methods on the, in the community, that's paternalistic too. So, I mean, you know, at what point do we start to say, well, one form of paternalism or parentalism is morally acceptable and another isn't? I mean, it's just a matter to me of outcomes as a, pra as a sort of a pragmatic thinker. So, um, I, hopefully I answered your question. Uh. So, I agree, removing people from the community and putting them in facilities, any kind of a facility, would solve some problems. Let's just make people disappear. Let's just move them away. We don't have to look at them anymore. We don't have to deal with them. We don't have to hear them yelling. Yes, and then we can say, and it's good for them because they're getting treatment and it's good for us. We don't have to deal with it anymore. But I would argue, where is the humanity? And where is the respect? I mean, I've spoken to so many people um, who suffer from severe psychiatric illness and um, you know, my heart goes out to them, my heart goes out to their families. This is not an uncommon disorder, you know, unfortunately, and people are struggling with it every day and we need to work with people who have mental illness to try and make their lives better. So what kinds of things can we do? Well, first of all, housing. Studies have shown that providing housing for people um, who have serious mental illness can be incredibly helpful um, in terms of, of course, getting people um, off the street, but also in terms of engaging them in treatment. And then let me just describe what happens in behavioral health court because I've done research um, on behavioral health court. When it was uh, established in San Francisco, we were asked to help them evaluate whether it works because it takes money. Um, in order to pay for a court. And so the court said, we know we're gonna be going back to the Board of Supervisors, we know we're gonna be asking for some money, help us evaluate the effectiveness of this. So we met with all of um, the stakeholders, we've published uh, multiple articles about this, but we also attended behavioral health court. So these are people, um, many of whom um, do suffer from schizophrenia, often in conjunction with substance abuse. There's a decision about whether someone goes to a drug court or a behavioral um, health court, because often it's the same population, but a lot of it depends on what's the um, more significant um, diagnosis. So people who have mental illness often have substance abuse, but if the mental illness is the major part of it, then they go to behavioral health court. If the substance abuse is the major part of it, they'll often go to the drug court. So these are um, people who have been involved in misdemeanors. There, there are also in San Francisco some felonies, um, but it is on the basis of their mental illness. And they are given the option. And the public defenders um, work on it and they meet with their client and they say to them, you know, you're in jail we don't think you should be in jail, but you know you are certainly entitled to your rights to go in front of the judge to have a trial, and we know you did it, and you're you know you're going to be you know staying in jail or possibly going to prison, or there is an option for you, and the option is I might be able to try and convince the district attorney that you are motivated for behavioral health court. And if the person wants, so this involves getting the cooperation you know, of the person, they go to behavioral health court. There is a judge, and this is very significant because the judge is in black robes. A lot of these people have had contact with judges in the past, and this is a more benign judge, and says, let's come up with a treatment program for you. If we're gonna keep you out of jail, you are going to have to go to substance abuse treatment. You are gonna have to stay in the housing that we provide. You're gonna have to take your psychiatric medications, which you haven't um, uh, taken. We're gonna do drug screens to make sure that you're not starting up again you know, on heroin you know, or on meth or anything. But if you are willing to do that, you can stay out of jail. 
And then the person comes back to behavioral health court, often on a weekly basis, and they, the judge says, how have you been doing? And, um, or the judge will say, I got back a substance um, abuse screen, and I think you, know, you were using some drugs. You know, we're going to give you one more chance. But it's a very different sort of situation at the graduation for Behavioral Health Corps, which is open to the public, um, by the way. So people graduate, they stand up. I mean, these are people who would, in the past, have been in state hospitals, would be in prisons doing really terribly. And for the first time, they have hope. I mean, they graduate, they, you know, everybody claps for them. You know, when they're graduating, they talk about what they're doing in terms of volunteering, in terms of trying to stay clean and sober, in terms of trying to stay in treatment. I mean, this is what we should be working towards. This is the solution, together with housing, together with treatment that is funded, um, funded well for all the programs that we know work very well um, for people with these disorders. So that is the solution. Are you talking about different populations? Are I, you don't, th I don't think we're talking about different populations. <laughs> I think that there might be, um, I mean, in my experience, people who have chronic psychotic illness with the appropriate treatment and with the appropriate supports, with the appropriate housing, can stay out of hospitals and can stay out of jails and prisons. We are talking about the same population. The different, in my opinion, um, I am talking about the patients who went in and out of Langley Porter Hospital. I am talking about people who have what we call serious mental illness. And we do have treatments that work for these people and with adequate support systems, those are the people that I'm talking about. We have, as I mentioned, citywide case management here. These are the people who are on the street who are seriously mentally ill. Um, so I don't think we're talking about different populations, but we are talking about different ways of providing care. Now, occasionally, some of these people might need a brief hospitalization. I mean, I'm not talking about closing the acute inpatient units. There's clearly a need for acute inpatient care. But it, as I said, it should be brief. It should be very symptom focused. And as soon as someone can be discharged into community care, they should be discharged because that's where they're gonna be living and we want to reintegrate them into the community. I, I think we might be talking about slightly different populations. And the reason I say so is because the people that I'm thinking about aren't writing letters to JAMA arguing that they could survive outside of an asylum. Um, and that's the case. I mean, if you're writing an op-ed, a, a, a letter to the editor of JAMA, and you're making, you know, these points, um, uh, chances are you were mis, you know, misplaced in an asylum. The people that don't have a voice, the people that aren't writing letters to the editors and being quoted in, you know, at fancy um, seminars are the ones I'm concerned about. These are the people that cannot speak for themselves, and these are the people that Justice Kennedy alludes to in the Olmstead decision. He says, um, this decision that said that individuals with disability, both mental and physical disability, should live in the least restrictive settings possible, if they can. Justice Kennedy said it would be a tragedy to overinterpret this decision as saying we need to deinstitutionalize every individual. He said that would be an absolute nightmare Justice Ginsburg, who wrote the opinion for the majority, said exactly that, too. So Olmstead's always held up as this decision that says, no, institution's bad, bad, bad. We've got to let everyone, you know, basically give everyone an apartment. Well, guess what? Everyone can't live in an apartment on their own. They need care. Uh, and, and the Olmstead decision has been, I think, mis- sort of has been abused, frankly, to, to, be, uh, to, to be used as support for this idea of community care for everyone. Look, I would... In an ideal world, that would be great. It's not an ideal world. There are individuals who need hospitalization. They may need it for six months. They may, may need it for a year. They may need it in perpetuity if they have other uh, issues like intellectual disabilities, severe intellectual disabilities. In fact, we were just talking about this back before the se session started. Christine Montross wrote a great op-ed piece in the New York Times shortly after our piece came out on the 
basically she took this argument and applied it to individuals with severe ID and classical autism and said, there's no places for these kids who are now getting older. Um, you know, so I mean, that's a different population, but I do, you know, to get back to your original question, I think we are, you know, I mean, there's some overlap, but frankly, I'm talking about the people who aren't, you know, writing sophisticated letters to JAMA to say, look, I, I was in an asylum and it was wrong for me. Of course it was, you know, I mean, that, so. So I was using, um, uh, quoting that gentleman just to make the point about what it's like to be institutionalized from someone who was institutionalized. Um, but um, years ago, people said many people needed to be in institutions, that they could not live on their own. This was true of people with intellectual disability. We had all of these hospitals um, for patients who had severe developmental disability. Many of those people right now are living in the community. They are living in supportive housing. Now, they're not living totally independently. I mean, there are social services that come and visit them and make sure that they're eating. Um, they're going to day programs. They need supervision. But if you had asked someone when they were in Sonoma State Hospital or, you know, some of these hospitals, not Sonoma Hospital, you know, they would say, um, uh, you could never have these people living independently. They're just not capable. I think it's, it's an underestimation of strengths of people, plus the whole problem, as I mentioned before, is that when people are in an institution, they become weaker, they become less reliant on themselves, they became much more dependent. So as people were released from hospitals, you had to give them social skills, you had to teach them how to live um, independently. But the population that's being served by assertive um, case management um, by citywide case management are people who are incredibly ill, um, both with psychiatric illness as well as with substance abuse problems. But we need resources to treat these people. So I disagree. So I'm sure we'll come back to this yeah. debate. Uh, you mentioned how other countries do better on community me mental health care. I'd love to ask each of you to address the question of a country that you would see as a model, uh, where, you know, at least mm -hmm. on the spectrum, doing better than the U.S. does, and what are the characteristics of the type of care? So I think so, I mean, I think, so I'll take it actually as a question about doing better at the institutional model, because I think, I mean, there's countries doing better at both community and at the institutional model, uh, institutional side, and I think the Netherlands presents a nice case study in this. They have therapeutic communities that are not very large, but they're bigger than your stand, you know, the sort of four or five, six people congregate settings that we have. They're, you know, maybe 50, 60 beds, and they're modeled in a way that individuals can basically live their lives, you know, for the period they're there as if they're in a small, like, village, actually. Now, is that sort of an ersatz sort of town that's sort of, you know, is that weird? Is that strange? It could be. I mean, you could say that that's just sort of a, um, a sort of a strange faux sort of environment, but it seems to work. It's a therapeutic community that seems to work. Um, and that, to me, is a, is a nice model. Uh, you know, when we talk about, um, the, when, when Dr. Binder mentions that, you know, these uh, uh, institutions are, um, are in implicitly harmful or intrinsically harmful. I think you, you're, you're correct in saying that about some of the old state hospitals, but there are new models that are not. And if you go online and just look up Cooper Reese and look at some of the alumni from that place, they are filled with hope when they leave. They are, so they've been there, inpatient, six months a year, and they're not, their hope is not dashed. It's actually created. So I think if we're going to draw on the past and keep appealing to the history here. We gotta be careful because I think the history really will stop us from doing what needs to be done. Other so yeah, so there, are, there are therapeutic communities um, in different parts um, of the world, you know, as described uh, by Dr. Sisti, where um, people live um, in the village and um, they get reintegrated, but we don't even have to go outside. I mean, we can look at a place like Topeka, Kansas, which used to be the home of Menninger's. So it used to be people would go to Menninger's and they would stay for a year. Sometimes they'd stay even longer and get the treatment um, in the hospital. 
partially spurred by the fact that very few people can afford to stay on an inpatient um, unit um, for that long a time, um, they started to have briefer hospitalizations. And you know, as soon as someone could, they would go into day programs and they would live with people um, in Topeka and come into the hospital. So part of it was certainly financially driven in terms of the costs of um, inpatient hospitalization. But as they did it, they realized that this was even better because you didn't get the negative impact of, again, being told you know, in a very regimented way about what you have to do which is not what everyday life is about, and it is harmful um, to people. And you can still get them involved in treatment programs. And those programs are expensive also, but they're less expensive than keeping someone um, in a hospital, um, and they work much better. This is reminding our radio and internet audience that they're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California and a discussion on uh, treatment of mental illness, asylums, versus and community care in the United States. Um, the, someone in the audience raises a question that I also have, which is, what are the interests of the community? So we all know the stories of those who have come into the mental health care system and into law enforcement who have not been in an institution or kept or treated and have gone on to do terrible things. Shoot people, etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember, we all have these instances. One of my favorite teachers in high school, a math teacher, also a cellist and an actor in Disney films, was bludgeoned to death by his adult mentally ill son who was receiving community care of that era. So what is the community's interest and how do we protect uh, others from being victimized by mentally ill folks who may be violent? So let me just, I'm going to defer to Dr. Bender on this because she's part of the MacArthur group on this. But that, I think, question is predicated on a, on a, on a deep misconception, which is that seriously mentally ill people are, are, are horribly violent. They are not, um, by and large, unless you add in the substance abuse disorder. And then some things get, you know, there could be a, an uptick in violence. But I don't think that that, I, you know, the notion of violence um, should drive, really, our policy choices here. And I think that that's one problem that I have with with, um, with a, the, the um, uh, Tim Murphy bill that's been proposed, is that a lot of that bill is couched in terms of preventing violence from happening. And frankly, individuals with mental illness are, not, are, are usually victims, they're not violent people. Um, so I think that that's you know, a big problem. So that's my sort of preamble to, I think, what Dr. Binder could fill in. So very few people who have serious mental illness are actually violent. And most violence is committed by people who do not suffer um, from mental illness. Now, there is an association between violence um, and mental illness, and certainly when we hear about these horrible crimes, a lot of them um, do suffer or may suffer from some sort of mental illness, depending on how broadly you define what mental um, um, illness is. But the problem with that is there are, unfortunately, so many similar people um, in the community who are exactly like these people um, who suffer, who wind up doing these um, horrible things, and only a tiny, 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 you know, percentage of those people will actually do anything. So what that means is, let's say you locked everybody up. First of all, you're locking up a lot of people who would never, ever be violent. And the other thing is, if we locked up everyone who had mental illness, and we said, oh, now we're safe. We are not safe. I mean, that is just the tiniest little um, proportion of the violence that's committed. We are going to have still an awful lot of potentially violent people in the community. So we really haven't done anything um, to decrease the problem. But we do need more treatment. We need early identification, and we need resources to treat people. And whether they wind up killing themselves, of course, there is um, an association certainly between um, depression and suicide, and also other kinds of mental illness and suicide. Um, and um, and a, a small proportion of these people might commit violence. Of course, the most likely victims are family members, um, and we can 
decrease this um, with good treatment and good resources and good supportive care. Let's talk about cost for a moment. Um, there's, there have been some studies uh, recently of uh, full cost of homelessness mm -hmm. uh, and associated mental illness issues mm -hmm. uh, of relying on the community care model and, and what you call the transinstitutionalization of uh, mentally ill folks into the jails, into the emergency rooms, on the streets and back through the cycle. The full cost accounting showed that the cost of homelessness is much greater than the cost of housing people. Right. Yep. Um, what, what are the relative costs of the systems uh, you're, you're talking about? What would it cost to implement a system of, say, humane, yeah. new style, new thinking asylums? <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is where versus appropriate community. This is where care. we stopped our paper. Actually, this is where, <laughs> this was at the end, and we said, hmm, I don't know. Um, I mean, here's the here's the issue. I mean, it's like we we originally set out to develop an economic argument about this, and it turns out it's a lot cheaper to keep mentally ill individuals in prison, and we really don't know what the actual cost is for that cycle of prison, homelessness, acute care setting, prison, homeless. You know that sort of revolving door cycle because. I mean, I, I'm not an economist, um, but I, I, we, we talk to economists, and it's tough to get the numbers because it's different. There are different lines of funding. There's criminal justice, there's housing, there's you know health care, um, but that's got to be pretty expensive, right? I, you know, intuitively speaking, that has to be pretty pricey. Um, so you know, I, so th that's probably the most expensive of all of them, right? Prisons cheap. The institutional, you know, developing modern institutions would be expensive. I. Um, it would be more expensive than community programs, but again, I think we're talking about a different population, right? So, um, you know, so it's sort of a non-question, you know, non-issue here. The the uh, the question I think is, is it within our sort of social and moral set of priorities to fund these places if we think that they're necessary and and good? And the answer seems to be no. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I think that part of the um, reason we deinstitutionalized, you know, uh, obviously it was about civil rights and take, you know, doing right by people who were autonomous that could live in the community. But let's be honest, it was a, it was a, a there was a conservative push to shut down these places because they were expensive, and you know these interesting bedfellows aligned around this idea of closing these places um, because they were expensive. But I, th I, you know, again, if you were to accept the premise that there is a population that does need to be in a structured setting for a, a, a period of time that's longer than, say, six months, if you accept that premise and you think that that's the right place for an individual uh, to get the right health care at the right time in a beneficent way that's recovery-oriented, then I think we agree. And I think that uh, the question is now, how do we raise that as a priority on our budgets? Because our budgets, to me, are moral documents. And if we're saying, all right, we, we know this is a need here, but we're not going to fund it. That says something about how we care about our, our most vulnerable uh, citizens, who I think are the, vo the voiceless individuals with mental, serious mental illness. So um, just to continue that for a second, uh, one of the audience members wants to know, is there a way to somehow move money out of the prison systems yes, and move, them, move it into the mental Well, so that's a big, yeah, so I've talked to criminologists about that idea and other and economists. There's, a, there's not much interest in doing that because a lot of our prisons are now corporatized and privatized. They have an incentive to keep their census high, and that's, that's obviously bad. Um, I, and then I'm going to like irritate everyone now and say um, uh, there's uh, correctional officer officer unions as well have a have a vested interest and I've read papers about that conflict of interest and so and so the this prison industrial complex has become a um, a, a, a beast in a sense that can't be tamed and I think that's where we're at so could we move the money out of there sure if the corporations were willing to say all right we're going to cut down on our census and then move them and you can move the money over um, I, you know. There'd have to be a sort uh, of a deft political. Absolutely. I mean, we have 700 individuals per 100,000 incarcerated in our country. That's more, that's like we're in another universe in terms of incarceration. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> there's reasons for that. It's not, I mean, it's, it's drug laws and, and stupid sentencing guidelines, but there's, there's other reasons. 
So I would argue it differently. First of all, the move to get people out of correctional systems is a bipartisan issue. It's really um, uh, interesting. I mean, people come from it from slightly different perspectives. Um, Republicans tend to support it um, for financial considerations. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons um, in terms of um, decreasing the cost. I'm involved with an initiative called the Stepping Up Initiative, which is um, involved with the American Psychiatric Association, but also judges are involved in it, and um, counties nationally um, are involved in it, because it is costing them so much money to have all of these people housed in jails. They want to get people um, out of jails. But there certainly are financial costs to homelessness that are reflected in a variety of ways. People who live in the street are much more likely, I mean, there's just an example, to get all kinds of medical conditions. You know, whether it's um, infectious disease, whether it's pneumonia, um, whether it's, um, um, uh, you know, uh, problems with their um, circulation and gangrene, you know, they cut themselves and they don't get treatment for it, and then before you know it, they need to be hospitalized. Those people, in general, are going to hospitals, and once someone is hospitalized medically, the costs are astronomical. Mm -hmm. So, and who's paying for it? I mean, we're all paying for it, you know, t um, our tax dollars are paying for it at the county hospital. So homelessness um, is very um, expensive. I also want to say that we have a very special opportunity in California, which has not been utilized to the extent that it could be. So um, as many people remember, we had a proposition on the ballot, Proposition 63. Um, which was passed. We have the Mental Services Act. Um, some people call it the millionaire's tax in California, where every dollar that people generate, over a million dollars, um, that goes into the special um, mental health fund. And if we think about what could be done um, with this fund, much more than is even being done right now in terms of housing programs, um, more community um, uh, programs, um, more case managers, um, more drug treatment programs. I mean, if we just think about what we could do with that money to try and provide better treatment for people in the community um, uh, where they live. I mean, I um, think that uh, it might be a, a possibility um, uh, to do that, and I mean, it would just be incredible what we could accomplish in the state of California. Quick one, the word asylum has a lot of negative connotations. Is there a better word? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, some days I think there probably would have been. Um, uh, I, you know, we went back and forth with this title um, a few dozen times, but essentially we decided on this. And I remember that, you know, the day I actually decided like this made sense was um, I had been reading a book called Asylum, which was the history of Friends Hospital in Philadelphia, Quaker-based psychiatric hospital, the first psychiatric hospital in our country, started by a Quaker minister named Thomas Scattergood, which laid out the principles of moral treatment, which were, um, you know, which were uh, inspired by the works of William Took and Philippe Pinel, uh, Took in the UK at the York Retreat. And um, the idea there was to create a safe sanctuary for healing, to give people a place to go and find meaning in work um, they were the first people to ever, you know, this uh, Friends Asylum was the first place to ever use pet therapy. Pet therapy. This was like in the late 1700s. I mean, you know, it's uh, stuff like this is coming back now, but this was done then. Horticulture therapy, you know, farming, different things that gave people a sense of meaning. And this, you know, this book is sitting there and I think, Jesus, this, this is exactly like the kind of beneficent uh, sort of institution uh, that you know, seems like, you know, utopian in a sense, but maybe it's possible. Maybe it's, it's you know, some version of this is plausible. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be off in, like, the country in some bucolic place. It should be really embedded within a city, in a, in a city and in, in, in sort of enmeshed in the medical system. I have some ideas on how that could happen, but this basic notion of a place where moral treatment can be dispensed with the top technology, with our understanding of ethics, with our, you know, the, the recovery model in place, uh, seems like 
a viable thing to talk about, like not something that should, you know, uh, it, it seems like a, a, a possibility. So the word asylum, uh, it definitely, I think, uh, upset a lot of people because they saw the byline or the, uh, the the subtitle and thought Jesus is a return to Byberry. It's not. If you get down to the second column, I think it's like seven sentences in. Uh, you see that we re, you know we use the literal meaning, which is from the Greek and Latin, which means safety or sanctuary. Um, and you know, was it provocative intentionally? I, I'll leave you to decide that on your own. Look at my um, senior author um, on this, um, but. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, I think it was just as a, you know, really as a conceptual um, uh, sort of motivator for this idea. So I think asylum is a terrible word because it brings back um, memories, but I think any word um, is still a very bad concept. wanted to challenge something um, that you said where you said, well, six months of hospitalization, you know, might do the job. As far as I know, there aren't any studies that say six months of hospitalization is better than three months or better than um, uh, three weeks. So there used to be um, research that was done. Some of it was done at UCSF. Ira Glick and Bill Hargraves, who used to work at Langley Porter, did a study comparing what they called um, short-term hospitalization and long-term hospitalization. I had that tone in my voice because the short-term hospitalization, I can't remember if they used three weeks. I think it was three weeks and three months because nowadays a three-week hospitalization is a very long hospitalization. You know, our average length of stay is maybe between five and seven days, you know, in most hospitals. But they compared three weeks and three months, and what they found is there was no difference. I mean, what they were looking for is that there was a difference so that insurance companies would be willing to pay for the um, uh, three months of hospitalization, but they found there was no difference. So, um, I mean, that's what the studies show, that long-term hospitalization does not um, increase or improve the prognosis. Now, long-term treatment is a different Long-term treatment definitely improves the prognosis, but not within a hospital. Um, get the person out of the hospital, stabilize them, make it clear that they can live outside the hospital, and then provide community-based treatment for them. And though there are, there is a lot of research that supports that. So trying to get to this issue of uh, civil rights and protecting people's independence and so on, in the vision of a more humane asylum, how would people get there? Mm -hmm. What would, would the steps be? Who would the decision makers be? So, so let me just back up and say, uh, coercion is the key question here. And we both agree that coercion is required. Let's be honest. Assisted outpatient treatment is really a euphemism for compulsory treatment. If you're saying to somebody, you better get on your meds or you're going into, the, into, into jail. That seems very paternalistic and very coercive to me. I'm okay with that, but let's be honest, it's coercive, right? So, you know, if that's, the, if that's how we want to frame the discussion, let's just be clear about our terms. Assisted outpatient treatment is a euphemism from court-mandated treatment where you go to jail, basically. It works, it saves money, it's good, but it's coercive. So. What about coercion into the, into the inpatient settings? Well, there might be times, and there are times, I think, when individuals want to be there, okay? So we don't even have to worry about it. In fact, there was just a piece about three months ago in the New York Times about a guy named Me Michael Meganson, who's at Rikers Island, has been there for years. He's failed in every community treatment he's been in. His assertive care treatment teams have, um, you know, have been there pestering away, and he cannot stay compliant. He himself wants to be in a hospital, there are no hospital beds. He's in Rikers Island, languishing. So there's a population that wants to be there. I've had friends who have had crises, uh, suicidal, been told they're ready to go. They're not ready to go, they say. They're kicked out. You know, uh, <laughs> this idea that le less hospitalization, you, know, you alluded to uh, uh, moms after being, I, I can't tell you, I, I mean, I'm a young parent, I have two kids. When my, when my wife had her first, she was out of the hospital within like 12 hours. She was not ready for that. I, don't, I disagree with that premise that uh, more hospitalization is all, I think weeks long can be bad, but I think you kind of get people stabilized and give them the care they need without looking at your bottom line and worrying about managed care concerns. That to me is the problem. So, uh, 
sorry, I forget the original question. The, <laughs> the, the uh, I mean, the, the idea. What would be the process through okay. which someone so if an individual is, is seriously at you know, a risk of harm to themselves, let's say they're cutting, self-harming. I remember a case I consulted on a woman could not stop ingesting foreign objects. She was eating staples, nails, button batteries, pins, needles. Uh, she she, she um, ingested a small pair of knitting scissors, right? She was in a community setting, in an apartment. They kept putting her back there. She kept doing it over and over and over. She went to this hospital, it was in Delaware, over 40 times to the ER in one year. She had x-rays. They were worried, that the, young, the, the, ex, the, the radiologists were worried they were giving her cancer because of the number of rads she had been exposed to. Right? So to me, a person like that deserves, frankly, to be in a, in a safe, safe place. All right? Now, if she can be stabilized and brought home to a, a, and given it a, but I think there are people who actually need to be in a safe place. So if there so, are, so she would be referred by that hospital who is X-raying yes. her, or, or the police would bring somebody in, or they go. I'd hate court, to get or, the police involved. Yeah. I, I think that if it's you know medical choice, and again I re, I go back to Olmstead here. Justice Ginsburg says that that decision should be made by a qualified medical professional, and I trust that. There are qualified, I mean, we can go back in time and say, yes, there are all these medical professionals who said, oh, no, you're, you need to be locked away forever. And they were bad. They were wrong. But I trust today that we can have a system where there's oversight and transparency, where uh, advocates can be involved, where family members can be involved, such that we can say to people, look, you better stay put for a while. That's all. So let's remember that we all have the right to refuse treatment, even if it's doing harm to ourselves. So someone who is having repetitive strokes or repetitive you know, um, transient ischemic attacks and people say, you need to be on aspirin, you need to do something about it, and they say, I don't want to take it. If they don't have a serious mental illness, they don't have to take it. Someone who's having heart attacks and their family is saying, you know, you need to get treatment for this, you need to exercise, you need to get your cholesterol down, you, know, you need to do you know, all the things that you need to do to decrease your risk of having a heart attack, and the person says, well, thank you very much, but I'm not interested. That's okay. The time that we can do involuntary treatment, and it's a very limited thing, is when someone has a serious mental illness that is a that, um, and on the basis of that serious mental illness, they are a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or unable to provide food and shelter, food, shelter, and clothing to themselves. That is the um, law in California. People do all sorts of things that are harmful to themselves, but we don't put them in psychiatric hospitals unless they have a major mental illness. And people do all sorts of dangerous things if we, and are danger to others. If we think about the typical gang member who's constantly being involved in fights, we don't put them in psychiatric hospitals even though it would get them off the street. And even though it's pretty clear they're a danger to others, I mean, the first thing they do is they're going to go and you know, stab someone you know, or shoot someone. So it is a very um, limited process. No, I was going to go. Oh, sorry. So when, um, when someone meets those criteria, it's appropriate as long as they meet their criteria. Now, people can appeal it. And I have sat through many, many, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of hearings where people do appeal it. Um, and the question is, there's a judge um, who decides whether or not um, the person makes a good argument that they are no longer suicidal, they're no longer a danger, and that they are able um, to take care of themselves. Now, for people who don't want treatment, who have a serious mental illness, we have lots of tools that we can use. The less coercive it is, and the more respectful it is of civil liberties um, is, is um, the best. Um, a process mandatory outpatient treatment, assisted outpatient treatment is controversial. A um, couple of weeks ago, I um, was um, uh, I went to the Royal College of Psychiatrists um, in England. I gave them um, actually the the keynote um, address about mental illness and violence, which is very similar in the British countries as it is to us. And there was a debate about assisted outpatient treatment. They call it something else um, in the British countries and whether it works um, or not. And um, it works some of the time 
for some people under certain circumstances. It doesn't work for everyone. We've just started it in San Francisco County. There's a very, very small population um, that it may help. It's the people who are constantly in and out of these, um, you know, of a psychiatric hospital, and they get better, and then when they leave the hospital, they don't comply um, with the treatment. And so for those people, it is an extra tool. But there are lots of other things that work also, and it was very clear from um, the work they were presenting in England and also from some of the studies that have come out of the United States. Um, good case management, good assertive community treatment, um, housing, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things um, uh, can work besides just um, the coercion, which may be necessary for certain people under certain circumstances. So quickly, Dr. Sisti, and then I'm going to pose our last question. Okay. Because we're but, just I mean, about my, out of time. I just wanted to weigh in there because I think in the example of the, the gang member, they go to jail, right? Um, they are confined. They go to jail. So they don't go to a mental institution, of course. And the second I'm piece saying was before they commit the violence. It's well, clear once people commit violence, they go to jail. I'm talking oh, about well, someone who's dangerous. There uh, are well, many dangerous people. Okay. We know they're Nobody. dangerous. Okay. Uh, the other piece was that uh, analogy over to, uh, I forget what it was, statins or heart disease. I mean, we're talking about individuals who lack capacity. Individuals who have capacity and refuse medical treatment should be able to refuse med medical treatment. Look, you're a forensic psychiatrist. This is a capacity issue. When an individual lacks capacity, there is an interest in respecting one, their wishes, if they've written up a psychiatric advance directive perhaps, or they've explained what their wishes were to a loved one, you try to meet their values, but if they haven't and you're trying to figure out what to do with an individual who lacks capacity, you treat them. Well, I've said in many of these, with California, we call it the Reese hearings about to determine, and what someone thinks lacks capacity is... Um, <laughs> There's instruments. I mean, it's a, so, it's a validated so, term, concept. So this debate could go on, and I hope it will go yeah. on, <clears throat> in journals and in the uh, public uh, forums like the Commonwealth Club. I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we'll unfortunately have to wrap it up. If each of you could do one thing or would like to see one thing done to advance your concept mm -hmm. for improving mental health care in the United States, very briefly, what would it be? I have this crazy idea of building structured residencies for individuals with serious mental illnesses on college campuses so that the individuals would have the ability to get jobs, to work on campus, students would have interaction because it's been shown that direct contact decreases stigma, they, there would be a place for individuals who are in the healing professions to train and work with individuals uh, with mental illness and I'd like to see that happen. It'll never happen, but I'd love to see it happen. Yeah. Could you imagine somebody, you know, a parent who's about to send their kid to Stanford reading the brochure that says, we have a structured inpatient facility on our <laughs> campus, your student can be, but I, I mean, I think that it would work. I mean, I really do. So anyway. Okay. Let's come up with systems of care, systems of community care with different kinds of treatment that is well funded, um, where we involve patients in it, we involve providers in it, when appropriate, we involve family members, but let's give it adequate resources to really provide high quality, evidence-based care, getting people reintegrated into the community as quickly as possible. If we had the money to do this, it's incredible what we could do in communities. This has been a fascinating discussion. Our thanks to Dr. Dominic Sisti, Director of the Program for the Applied Ethics of Behavioral Health Care and Assistant Professor in the Departments of Medical Ethic and Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Renee Binder, President of the American Psychiatric Association and Psychiatrist at the UCSF Medical Center for debating this question of how best to improve mental health care in the US. Thank you to our audience here, our audiences on the radio, and on the internet. I'm Gloria Duffy. Now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned.